will begin in five minutes. Yes. Yeah, I should have mentioned that, that we, yeah. so we're now live, but we take about five minutes to let everybody show up and sit down, and I get to say hello to everybody by name. Tubes to unclog. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. so the... Uh, the world can see you. Exactly. But now people can see us, in theory. But uh, as always, they have to <laughs> uh, confirm our existence before we can continue. I love continue. the stuffed things. What are the I stuffed got, things? This is Pluto, and mm -hmm. this is Sharon, oh, and they're nice. a binary pair. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that are magnetically linked, just in this. But aren't they also, that's like, cute. with that a string really together? Cute. You just can't. Oh, well, yeah, that's just because I haven't cut the string off of it yet. Right. Not because that's not physical. Yeah, you're not willing to rely on the uh, magnetism alone. That's anyway. <laughs> wanted to show off my little plushies. Go higher, because you're actually <laughs> down at the bottom of the. There you go. Yeah. They're so happy. They love you. <laughs> Hello to <laughs> Alex Displan, Andy Cowley, Astro B, Bill Sugden, Bill K, Christian Woodland, David Dunn, David Hall, Frank Tippin, Giselle Seberin. J, Alec Anderson, James Aberson, Johnny J, Kevin N, Larry Beckham, Lillian Brennan, Martin Bradshaw, Nancy Graziano, Neil Yu, Nightbot, Paranor, Sergio Botero, Tom Van Scotter, Uncle Bill Druin, and Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, Paul had to step out at the last minute. So whatever super interesting astrophysics news that he was going to bring uh, is lost to us forever. It's all planets all the time now. It's all planets all the time. Planetary science. Yeah, I'm just gonna save and the- And rockets, I suppose. I have no rocketry to talk about. Aren't you talking about the, I guess, the moon thing? I guess, but that's like the moon and missions and landers. I can't believe it's like already, this is like number second time that we're gonna have a thrice launched rocket and it's already old news. <laughs> Yawn. It's like, oh yeah, they oh, I didn't even get to that it's... part of the story yet. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, this is one of the second thrice launched weren't they originally going to be launching on a falcon heavy no i don't think so this is a really small thing no but i thought they were tucked in on a maybe they were going to team heavy, but they're tucked in on this falcon 9 with a um nro yeah payload yeah that we shall not speak of <laughs> it and... doesn't exist <laughs> because we know nothing about it yeah um and so because of that there may be some restrictions on the launch video I would it would not surprise me if there was no live uh, stream from the rocket. They are planning to live stream it on Friday for for SpaceX, but oh, I don't yeah. know if and it's when. Unusual when that hap for that to happen. Yeah, the so it's going to be launching with a wait. I sh why am I even oh. talking about this? This is like news. I'm just like yeah, you're you're, you're jumping the gun. Okay? I am totally jumping the gun. Let's talk more about <laughs> save it, stuff. Save it. Pluto and Sharon. Hey, everyone, if you missed it, uh, Kimberly was my special guest on Monday on my channel, and we had a great time, and it was a great chat, yeah, and people really, really enjoyed awesome. it. We got to talk about all sorts of stuff that we never get to talk about yeah. on this show. Um, and it was really great. Yeah, and like we got, like, got to take, get your questions. And then on yeah. Monday, uh, we'll be talking with Morgan, so just yeah. keep, keep the... Yeah. So I learned that in like, the... what is it? What is it, Fraser? Something in like 10 years, I'll owe you dinner because I'm going to lose horribly. <laughs> oh, because I forget which like one it bet. was. Because yeah, they're going to find over... life via yeah. telescopes instead of finding it in in the solar system. Yeah, we, okay. we bet whether we'd find it robotically in the solar system yeah. first or if we detect it remotely in an exoplanet first. Well, yeah. since there's like 0% chance of being sure that you detected it remotely, I would not want that side of the bet. Ooh, uh, that's a, hey, that's a good, I'm glad I took the other side. Kimberly, can you put your <laughs> camera down a little bit or sit up? Uh, just wow. so you're like, like the a, same as the rest adult? of us. Just the I same. Sit up like an adult. I wouldn't say that we're adults. Just like the same as the rest of us. Um, you were the odd one out. Attack wants to know if I've played Apex Legends. I haven't. I haven't even played Fortnite, so. I think that's old news now. Apex Legends? No, Fortnite. Yeah, Fortnite is done. Yeah, that's yeah. fast. Yeah, Apex Legends. You do the is dance, the new they hotness. come and arrest you, and <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah, um, that would mean that I would need to have time to play video games that aren't the few video games that I play all the time. So this thing on Monday is we're not just like playing video games or something, right? That's how it works. Like yeah, word, yeah no, we're talking. just going to play. Yeah, we're going to play. It's going to be meme review. Excellent. Word talking. Yeah. I like it. We're talking. Yeah, yeah it's going to be meme review. Oh, all right. I got to brush up on my uh, 
And your PewDiePie memes. Memes. Yeah. Oh, boy. I'm really glad we did not talk about that because I'd show just how much I don't know <laughs> about anything in, like, the past five years. I only know. I only no, try yeah. to learn about it so that I can keep – so I can still be cool in the eyes of my children. The only reason Why I learned. shouldn't have kids. Yeah, I oh, my cats don't care. <laughs> cats don't care. All right, you know what? Uh, we've reached the end of our five-minute time, and now it's time to move into the actual show proper. So I will reorganize the screen here. <clears throat> and now it's just Morgan on the screen. Yes! <laughs> Finally. You win. Winner. Now Morgan is the popular Something. one. All right. Uh, all right. Oh, now it's Kimberly. All right. Now it's me. I'm in control. All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, February 20th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about NASA's best budget ever, a new moon for Neptune, uh, searching for cold worlds from your couch, Hayabusa's about to land on Ryugu, how's the weather on Mars, and a friend of the show, Space IL, is about to launch a lander to the moon. Joining me this week, we've got on my screen right now, Kimberly Cartier. Kimberly. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day on the normal Wednesday <laughs> podcast day. And not the Monday. Not the special Monday podcast day. That's right. Uh, also, we've got Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. I, the camera didn't even switch to you. It's like Ooh. you have to say something Gosh. longer. There we go. All right. All right. Well, I'm very excited for this episode. Perfect. Well, and we're going to get to the reason why Morgan is so excited for this episode in a second. But first, I want to give a big special shout out to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are, of course, the fans, but also the executive producers of this show. They, they organize the guests. I have no idea. Our special guest was a surprise to me. Uh, organized by the Weekly Space Hangout crew. So uh, you should join this amazing community if you want to help make the show that you watch. This is how you do it. Go to wshcrew.space. They'll give you all the information. You can join their their community. Uh, they'll give you your business card. So you're an executive producer of the show. And of course, you can join the chat that we have down here at the bottom of the screen. So go ahead, do that. Go to wshcrew.space. All right, well, let's get on with the special guest. Emily Holt, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hi, thanks for having me on. Uh, so, as always, I like to ask the question, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> well, um, I'm an environmental archaeologist, and I'm currently a visiting assistant professor in the Classics Department at Miami University of Ohio. And um, I'm a prehistoric archaeologist. I work on the Bronze Age in Sardinia on a culture called the Nuragic Culture, primarily. Um, but I found myself getting kind of interested in archaeoastronomy this semester because of a class I taught. So this is, is, is that how that works? You learn by teaching? Oh, yes. <laughs> you learn a lot by teaching. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was teaching a, um, a uh, kind of a survey course, Greek uh, Introduction to Greek Civilization 101, everything from the Neolithic to the Hellenistic period. And I hadn't done that since grad school, since early grad school. So, yeah, I relearned a lot of stuff. So archaeoastronomy, uh, was the culture that you were studying, were they big astronomers or did you sort of branch out from there? So definitely branching out. Um, it's, it's really tough to prove that the culture that I studied uh, were big astronomers. They almost certainly were because um, watching the sky and um, thinking about what's going on and using that as a way to kind of time various, you know, agricultural activities or navigation or something, that's cross-culturally just super common. So almost certainly they were, but in order to really identify that in cultures that don't have writing, we have to have um, such a, a clear and obvious um, archeological example, something like uh, Stonehenge or Newgrange where the alignments are just absolutely smoking gun obvious because without that, the sky is so full of astro, you know, something happens all the time. So you can always find something to, to relate things to. Um, and there's a lot of claims made about the culture that I study, the neurogic culture, being very um, aware of astronomical events. Um, but, uh, but really the only thing that's um, more or less demonstrated is there's one temple that's an underground temple with a spring. 
And then when the moon is at the, its zenith in the area, it shines down through an opening onto the spring water below. It's not a 100% perfect alignment, but it's pretty darn good. So we feel pretty good about that one. <laughs> right, right. I, I mean, it's interesting to think, like, for sure, the, the ancient cultures would need to know when to plant, when the cold weather was going to start to change. Um, and so they would need to keep rough track of it, but would they need to keep an an accurate enough track of it that it was worth building monuments and pools underneath chambers and aligning um, pyramids to the belt of Orion and Nazca lines and all that kind of stuff. Like there's a certain point where it's well, like it's overkill. We get it. You want to know when the moon is coming back. Well, and for so many things, um, so, so much can actually just be preserved through folk knowledge. Um, and you don't need really specific observatory structures in order to preserve that. So like I said, it's really difficult to pinpoint that in ancient non-historic cultures, but we can get ethnographic examples from contemporary cultures that are doing the same thing, even though they're not writing it down. And one of my favorite examples of this um, is um, in 2002, an article was written by an anthropologist, a climate scientist, and a meteorologist, which sounds like the start of a joke. Starts a joke, yeah. Uh, it really does, um, but it's a great article. And it's all about their encountering of these folk beliefs um, among Andean farmers that if the Pleiades, when they first uh, rose after what is their winter solstice, and of course our summer solstice, um, looked kind of fuzzy or dim or small, it was going to be a bad year for, for potatoes and they should wait and plant the potatoes late. And everyone was coming up, kind of coming across this folk belief. And so they were sort of like, well, is there any validity to that? Let's, let's check it out. You know, can we, can we demonstrate this scientifically? And it totally turned out that the lower um, visibility was due to lower um, uh, atmospheric transparency due to the El Nino effect, which also caused decreased rainfall. So it was a completely valid observation. Um, and people were using it to time their potato planting uh, with measurable results. So that kind of astronomical observation is almost certainly going on in all these ancient cultures, but you don't need a Stonehenge to keep track of right, it. Right, right. So you don't need to build the machine that allows you to see the, the image of the Pleiades cluster falling upon your pool in your cavern. You just exactly. tell, your grandma just tells you and points to the sky and goes, that's what it looks like when it's bad. Exactly. And you all go up on a high rock and check. And go oh, check. Yeah. That, was, yeah. that doesn't look yeah. great. Let's, let's wait. So, so, I mean, the fact that, that this seems to be the case, that it's much more about folk culture than necessarily about gigantic structures, that casts into like a stark contrast a lot of the claims made by people who are into archaeoastronomy and perhaps some of the people into pseudo archaeoastronomy that various things were meant for astronomical purposes. I mean, do those claims very often hold up or is it usually not? Most of the time, there are so many possible and alternative explanations that um, we they they can't so it's the kind of thing where it's not necessarily a bad question, but it's not a testable question. And so, you know, there are all kinds of fields that ask untestable questions. Humanities asks often many kinds of questions that are untestable or ethics. We care about those fields, but you can't test those questions. So I don't exactly want to say that wondering about these things is bad, but it is often untestable. And so it's not something that can really hold up one way or the other uh, when subjected to scientific you know, inquiry. Um, so, you know, it's the kind of thing that can be fun to speculate about. But um, what I think is really interesting is when we do get into more historic cultures, we can see a really impressive um, level of astronomical observation that's being written about, that's being modeled, that's even being modeled mathematically, um, which I think is pretty fantastic. And um, one of the recent discoveries that really caught my attention in that was uh, just very recently, um, a scholar at uh, the Humboldt University in Berlin made a discovery of a Babylonian um, tablet. And this is a very late Babylonian. So it's basically like comparable to the Hellenistic period. So we're, we're talking like 350 BCE to like 50 BCE. So not the really old Babylonian. But anyway, um, it's this new tablet that kind of unlocks for other tablets. And what they do is use basically a version of calculus to describe uh, the orbit of Jupiter. And they're actually using a geometrical um, calculation to represent a not physical structure. You know, nothing, nothing that they can observe. 
So it's, um, it's really an extremely sophisticated level of mathematics, something that people didn't think happened until, you know, the mid 14th century in Europe. But d did the math exist for some practical purpose or, or, and, and they were able to use it to figure out Jupiter or was there any reason why they would need to know Jupiter with that level of accuracy for their, I don't know, for their horoscopes or something? Like so they probably had, um, reasons for wanting to be able to predict its movement. And yes, the math is, um, it's basically they're doing uh, kind of the area under um, a linear, um, just under a linear progression. Um, so it's kind of like calculus, it's not a curve, but, um, but uh, so it's geometry, it's, it's in a lot of ways just a basic geometry, they're calculating the area of a trapezoid. Um, so it certainly did exist for other purposes, but they're applying it in an abstract way to predict this, you know, this movement of Jupiter, um, which is pretty creative and uh, insightful. And almost certainly, yes, they have some reason for doing it, that knowing where Jupiter is at a given moment is um, ideologically significant. Right. But uh, I've got a question from Arjon here. Uh, what ancient culture was the most invested in astronomy and, and how did they show it? Oh, boy. Um, so I am not a global expert. Right. So that would be a tough one to um to answer with confidence but i would say that um the maya certainly developed an extremely detailed and um um accurate calendar and so that would be one group um that i would i would say is was extremely invested and we know that we're able to demonstrate it we're able to to um you know uh understand their the with their calendar system um i'm also quite taken with um hellenistic greece was really interested in astronomy. So um, at that time, you have this, uh, the, the first museum, which was basically, to my knowledge, the first government funded research institute that was founded by the, the Ptolemies in Alexandria. Um, and it had a whole bunch of, of just scholars in all different disciplines working on all kinds of different stuff and including astronomy. And it did have an actual astronomical observatory built into it. Um, but this is the culture that produced things like the Antikythera mechanism which is just incredible. I mean, it's this kind of shoebox yeah. sized, we think, you know, device that's able to predict multiple kinds of eclipses, that's able to track the movement of various planets, that's able to do calculations, that's able to uh, predict the date of the Olympics on this, you know, four year cycle. Um, and so all of that is really very impressive. It has 30 different years that interlock. And that level of technology is not something that you just wake up one morning and make and have it function perfectly. So it's clearly evidence that there's an entire industry that's interested in producing these kind of mechanisms for people to be able to keep track of this stuff. We have this particular example, but it's definitely, you know, an end point on a long line of development. So it, I'm curious about that because that's kind of a, something I've always thought about is, you know, the Antikythera mechanism always seems sort of so impossibly advanced compared to anything else we see from from sort of ancient technology. Do you think that's indicative of the idea that there was actually a whole range of more advanced technologies that we've never seen and which just happens that this one particular example survived and, and the others didn't? Almost certainly. So, um, so just to, just to point out, the Antikythera, Antikythera mechanism comes from roughly the same time as that Babylonian inscription I was just talking about. So there seems to be a lot of interest in um, the heavens and modeling the heavens going on kind of in the Mediterranean and Near East broadly at the time. Um, but I do think it, it is an indication that there was a lot more of this kind of technology that was uh, going on than we have preserved archaeologically. And this is, you know, archaeology is, has its limitations like, like any field. Uh, but we have descriptions of things like um, f big floats that they would um, have in parades in Alexandria that would be powered, we think maybe by coiled rope or possibly by steam, um, that would do things like have a figure that would stand up from a chair, pour a liquid from a, a, a vase into another container, and then sit back down, all completely automated. Um, so we're not really sure exactly how they achieved this, but clearly with some pretty sophisticated um, engineering. Yeah, it's it's weird that we only have the one example. We don't have this long line of all the different prototypes and, you know, the ones that were sold in certain markets and other ones. It's like one example of this. I mean, it is a little strange. Machine. 
but then also when you think about the fact that they are delicate implements, they're made out of expensive materials and um, they are very corrodible because they're made out of metal. So those are all things that kind of work against us as archeologists. Uh, you know, there are things that people, that if you leave it out in the weather, it's gonna break down. If you bury it, it's gonna break down. Um, one of the reasons we have the Antikythera mechanism at all is that it um, actually, you know, sunk in a shipwreck and was somewhat protected. Um, and if you uh, get hard on your luck, you're gonna melt it down. Uh, if you are, you know, desperate, you'll sell it and someone else will melt it down. There's a lot of reasons why, uh, especially metal objects like that are kind of susceptible to time. Um, of course, there is another, another factor, which is that there was a very active destruction of Hellenistic knowledge that was, you know, the Hellenistic knowledge that was still being preserved uh, in early Christianity. There was a very intentional destruction of these, uh, of the, the shutting down of the Plato's Academy, which had been running for 900 years at that point. Um, you know, shutting down the museum, uh, burning the Library of Alexandria. So some of it may also be very intentional destruction of things that had been preserved up till that point. Uh, so before the show, we were chatting about the similarities between astronomy and, and archaeology in the sense that they're both sort of trying to figure out these far off unreachable things by stringing together these these series of clues. And I'm, I'm wondering if there is a, Siri is interrupting me here. Uh, I'm wondering <laughs> if there is like a, a piece of that chain that is missing that you particularly would like to be able to go back and, and see. I think the rest of us probably all have our astronomical things that we'd like to go and visit just to know, is that really what it is? And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if what your equivalent to that might be. That's a really good question. Um, so I suppose I have two, two things. Um, I would love to know more about the culture that I study. Uh, they particular, so I study the Nuragic culture, like I said, and it um, starts in kind of the middle bronze age on Sardinia, but that's different for everybody. So it's, it's like about 1700 BCE, and it goes to maybe about 900 BCE, maybe a little later, depending on who's drawing the lines. Um, but during that time, they, you know, they were not a historic culture, so they didn't, didn't produce writing. And they also didn't produce a lot of figural art that we have access to. Um, I don't know, their pottery is pretty plain. They do some little bronze figures, um, but there's very little to help us interpret. And so that's very much a blank. And I would love to go back and just be able to ask or be able to observe, how are you looking at the sky? How are you interpreting this? What does this do for you? Is this part of your agricultural calendar? Is this part of your ideological system? Because there's there's just so little um, to uh, to go on there. Um, and then the other one would be, you know, jumping forward, a, you know, a, a good uh, thousand years and some uh, would be like, oh man, if I could just go hang out in the museum. That must have been the coolest place. Oh, it's like this yes. massive government-funded think tank <laughs> with <laughs> just everyone from astronomers to, to engineers to doctors to philosophers. That would have been fantastic. And just, you think we have something like that it. today? Like, what do you think in the world today is sort of most like that? I mean, in an ideal sense, I suppose universities are like that. But I feel like so rarely does everyone really get together and talk across the disciplines so i'm not i'm not sure if it does quite line up but a place I don't know. are we or are you thinking morgan like a place that future future historians will look at and try to go like what were they thinking what were they doing what were they trying to communicate here oh i was thinking more of the former but i'm sure there are a lot of the latter that won't <laughs> translate well you know a thousand yeah. years in, into the future what is this some kind of sport but we but the but we can't tell what kind of ball they used. Yeah, I always um, I get this question a lot. Actually, what what do you think people will not understand from our culture? And one of the things that always comes to mind right away is fidget spinners. <laughs> they have they're they're these lovely little technical devices that have no per like there's no ideological pur purpose. They're not economic. They are not used in ritual. They're not like who knows. And there's people a lot of them. Very confused. And there's Yo a lot yos. of them. There's got to be a whole bunch of things like that. Oh yeah. yeah. People are going to be like, what was this? <laughs> what was this for? Um, well, Emily, where can people find out more about what you're working on? Um, so I'm on the Miami University website uh, in the classics department. So you can uh, check me out there. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, please do feel free to follow me. I, I tweet a lot about my research. Um, I'm uh, at Emily underscore M underscore Holt. Um, so definitely follow me there. And I also do uh, have a blog 
errant.live, E-R-R-A-N-T dot live. Um, so check me out there. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, good luck puzzling out all these mysteries of the uh, ancient cultures. And uh, I can't wait to sort of see what you guys figure out next. Like as Morgan Great. and I were saying before, and that would be like our alt our alternative career paths oh, if we I could start all over again. Come. Well, yeah. hey, if you ever want to come out and volunteer, I'm sure I could put Ooh. you to work. Oh, that'd be great. Right. So that's tempting. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Have a great evening. All right. Now we're going to move into the news. Oh, that was so good. Uh, we Morgan, are... you're grinning like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love <laughs> so archaeology. I'm so excited. I would drop everything to be an archaeologist. Super cool. Well, you I do love learning about the astronomy of ancient work cultures. Work now in a museum, so it's close. Yeah, it's one of the of strongest stuff has going points. To, is yeah, when I get to work with dinosaurs or you know hold a skull or something, I just like it's way more fun than talking about astronomy. <laughs> so much better. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've uh, got um, uh, we've got fossils all around here. Like where I live used to be an ancient seabed, and so you can go to like where the river is carving out. A, a chunk of the landscape and your you house can, just full of them the our house is often full of fossils yes but they're all like sea fossils right so like little clams or little mussels and and but it's the still really cool the coolest thing was an elasmosaur that they pulled out of the river that's like three blocks away from my house what yeah the, the oh, head so cool. was in a concretion that kind of came out of the side of the river and then they tracked back the rest of the elasmosaur so like you know like a plesiosaur like a gigantic sea monster and they so cool. yeah amazing and it, it's in the local it's in our airport actually when you when you fly in and out of out of courtney there's a big elasmosaur in the hung up in the ceiling and it's in our museum and stuff and we also have a mosasaur as well which is another kind of horrible sea sure. monster yeah all right uh, kimberly you're on my screen right now what is the news so neptune has another moon yay 14 moons for Neptune. Good job. Uh, this new moon uh, is really, really, really tiny. It's only like 34 kilometers across. It's called Hippocamp. And this group of astronomers has been searching for it and trying to prove that it's really there for about 12 years. <laughs> and they finally got enough evidence that it really is there. Uh, they've tracked it. They tracked it, uh, first detected it in 2004. They got more measurement or more observations using Hubble five years later. They just got more measurements with Hubble in 2016. Uh, and so with that 12 year baseline, they can now say that this tiny little hunk of rock called Hippocamp actually orbits Neptune. Yay. <laughs> Every year, Hubble uh, takes a picture of Uranus and Neptune. And so I guess they've been they keep finding cool stuff there. Right. Like every time they take a picture, there's something cool going on with Uranus's atmosphere or storms, or there's cool aurora going on, or there's a new moon that we didn't know was there before. And how big is this moon? This is 34 kilometers across. That's smaller than some cities on this planet. It's a very tiny chunk of rock. It orbits in the inner part of the Neptunian system, so interior to Triton, which is the largest moon of Neptune. Uh, and it actually, this this tiny little moon orbits very close to the largest of the inner set of moons called Proteus. Uh, it actually, it, it orbits oddly close uh, and given the- Suspiciously close. Suspiciously close. Uh, and given the size of this tiny moon and where it's orbiting and the fact that Proteus has a very large impact crater on its surface, uh, this sort of lends more evidence to the idea that the inner part of the Neptunian system underwent a lot of uh, impacts after Triton was captured, possibly because Triton was captured. And this new moon may actually be some remnant of the large impact that uh, hit Proteus earlier in its history. So if Hubble's been taking pictures of this planet for every year now for 15 years, why now have we discovered this new moon? So this moon is super tiny and it's super, super faint. Uh, it's very difficult to, to detect in any one image from Hubble. You'd have to take a very long exposure with the Hubble Space Telescope to even see it. And when you do that, because this moon orbits very close to the planet, the light would actually get smeared out across the image because the moon itself is moving. And that's also why Voyager 2 didn't actually detect it. 
Uh, it detected the other six moons in the inner part of the Neptunian system, but it missed this one because the light was just smeared across the camera. And the same thing would happen with Hubble if it took a long enough exposure. You just wouldn't get enough light in any one pixel to see it. But what these astronomers did was they had a very clever way of stacking a bunch of images together that were taken over a longer period of time, but each image was a shorter exposure. And uh, using some very fancy algorithms, or very cool fancy algorithms, they were able to stack all these all these images together and add up all of the lights and figure out where Proteus, uh, where Hippocamp was at each of their observations. Is, is this similar to the technique, like when you're taking pictures, when you're doing astrophotography, you're gonna take a bunch of short images like say be maybe say a 60 second image or a 180 second image but you're going to take a ton of them like you're going to take 10 hours worth of them and then you're going to yeah. stack them all up together and then you're just going to ask a computer to look at every single pixel and go tell me where i am tell me what's the data and what's tell the noise me where i am keep shift, the data shift things around yeah. rotate things a little bit and make sure you know that all these spots all line up at the same time. Yeah, it's a very similar thing like that. Yeah. But with Hubble, you're talking about tiny, like thousandths of an arc second alignment. Hubble's pixels are so incredibly high resolution that you're talking, you know, hundredths of a pixel uh, alignment in order to add up all of the light from Hippocamp in order to actually see it. And it's still really faint. If you actually look at the images that were published with the paper or that you'll see in a lot of the articles online, um, the uh, the light coming from this moon is still really difficult to see. Uh, so the, that, the, that's how good this is. The breakthrough here uh, is basically that they don't just sort of stack the images up, you know, adjusting for the rotation of Hubble or the planet or whatever. They basically are moving every pixel in every image based on the expected orbital mechanics of that location. Uh, and this is a technique that was pioneered by Mark Showalter, who was the author of uh, the first author of this study. And and I would wager he's probably detected more moons than anybody else alive today. And they've all basically been like this. You know, he was the, the guy who led the team that found the new moons of Pluto when they were looking for rings. He's found moons, I think, at Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and maybe Jupiter. And, and never, no one picture ever has these moons in them. They are just so certain about how they're moving the pixels around in every picture over 10 years that it kind of just builds up to be there. And then when you go back, you can often do a more targeted search directly at it. And then you can snap that one picture that says, yes, it really is, is there, but it's basically just pulling them out of thin air. Uh, <laughs> as far as, as far as you can tell. So at this point, I mean, with the size of this moon orbiting this far away, do you think there are many planets left to find at this point? Or have we, pretty much found them all I mean, moons? any moons sorry yeah, we, yeah i know um, we have lots of planets still to find planet nine lots of planets still to find yeah, yes but... um so as far as the moons go uh one of the other conclusions of this paper is that they were able to rule out any other moons interior to triton's orbit down to a size of about 24 kilometers in diameter so given this incredibly advanced technique that they're using for imaging they can say if there were any moons interior to Triton larger than 24 kilometers, we would have seen it. So that's their limit for the for interior to Triton. Then, and then exterior to Triton, where there's a little bit less glare from the planet and the moons are moving a bit more slowly, uh, they were able to actually rule that down to about 20 kilometers in diameter, where they can say, you know, if it was there, we would see it. We don't see it, so there probably isn't, aren't any there. Now, there could still be smaller uh, smaller satellites or fragments from impacts. They can't rule that out definitively. And uh, Mark Showalter said, you know, the only way we're going to figure that out is if we actually send an orbiter there to see it. Yeah, Cassini found a number of satellites at Saturn that were, would have been smaller than these detection thresholds, including uh, Daphnis, which is, makes the outer of the two narrow gaps uh, in the rings. Uh, or the one that kind of looks like a Anthe, the one that kind of looks like a a ravioli that we saw, I think, is also smaller than this detection limit. Uh, and so if we sent, you know, uh, Cassini 2.0 to Neptune, I would wager we would find, you know, five to 10 more moons that are smaller than that. 
Uh, yeah. It, it'd almost be weird. Does that really if they matter? I, I'm right. looking at does the really moons matter, of though, Jupiter kind of right I mean, now. I would say it sort of does. And I will say for two reasons why it, why it does matter if those moons exist. One, because it will give even more evidence as to the history of the Neptunian system, which we know must have been chaotic, given that it captured a big honk and Kuiper Belt object sometime in its history <laughs> and messed up all the gravity. Uh, and two, we can't forget the fact that Neptune's rings are really wonky. Like there are some, they're weird arcs, they're clumpy, they're not smooth. Um, and rings don't tend to stay that way on their own. So, so of, of Jupiter's 78 moons, only 15 are bigger than... Smaller. Bigger than this one. So it has 60 moons that are the size of this new moon found around Neptune and smaller and 15 that are bigger. Yeah, at some point it becomes kind of just like a definitional argument. Yeah, yeah. Um, like Cassini, we started finding moons that were sort of like a kilometer in size. Yeah, and, that and that's point, what they're finding around Jupiter. Do you call them moons? Y yes, yes you like do. Space debris? Satellite debris. They even uh, have I mean, names. There are ring particles that we think could be up to hundreds of meters. Are they, are they moons? Yes, and they get names. Uh, and are things that are 10 meters, are they moons? And then no. you work your way down. Don't and there's be some ridiculous. definitional uh, ambiguity. And I would say- And then the other half of astronomers will argue with it and say, no, I want all the moons. Yeah. How dare you take my moon yeah. away? Don't I would say a kilometer away. or two kilometers is a pretty good lower limit. Below that, it's just kind of like noise. So above that is meaningful stuff. So based on how many moons that we know are at Neptune and how many are at Jupiter and how many are smaller than this new one that's been found at Neptune, I predict you just like write it down. I'll, I will accept my Nobel Prize. You're in taking form. so many bets this week. Another true. Another 30 moons at Neptune. 30. And there's there's yeah. good reason to think that Neptune would have many fewer than Jupiter. Uh, for one, there would have been a lot less material in that part of the solar system when Neptune was forming. Uh, for two, Jupiter has the Trojan asteroids as a ready supply of small objects to get caught. Mm. Three, Jupiter orbits closer to the main asteroid belt and would more easily collect objects that were being kicked by interactions, say, with Ceres. Uh, and so I would expect that as you move oh, wow. outwards that you would see fewer and fewer with every planet. And four, Sport. Triton probably knocked all the other ones away. Right, right. Um, all right. Well, I'll I'm, take I'll take your bet. Yeah. Well, all I'm trying to do is justify sending a new mission out to Uranus and Neptune. Well, so we don't need so moons many to reasons. justify that. There's so just many. Just another reason. Reasons. Just another reason. Just, just to show you reason. that there are 30 more missing moons at both of those planets, and all we need to do is send a mission to them to dig them up. It's just. That's the thing. But the but the part that's interesting, and, but... and people are mentioning, Neptune is probably the only place in the solar system where a moon could have a moon. That the hill sphere around Neptune a works tune. out perfectly that... What? A, t a tune. Yeah, that's right. Moon, moon. Yeah, we got to make sure every time we say a moon, moon, uh, that we call it a tune because that is the official title designated as per the IAU as recommended by Morgan. But yeah, that so we could find a moon around a moon at Neptune, a tune. I'm not, I'm not calling it that. You're not? That's the, it's no. the official title. I'm sorry. If you wrote it down I'm a rebel. in an EOS thing, we could like put yeah. it in Wikipedia. We could well, cite it. I'm not going to write that. <laughs> oh, if only we could use it, we could use Universe Today for What's that. The point of it's being... just not, yeah. yeah, abuse your power. Yeah. Let's... I have very little power. I think you yeah, overestimate so you how it, much you, power you I have. You have it, and you can slip tune into the vernacular. I'm not going to. All right, Morgan, tell us about the best budget ever. Yes. Uh, we have a government here Yay. in the United States, and with that came a brand new budget for NASA. And it is truly an extraordinary budget. Uh, by some measures, uh, the best budget we've seen in a quarter century for NASA Uh and sort of taking the political climate into consideration, this could be the best budget NASA has seen in many decades. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of tick through here some of the uh, numbers that we saw. So last year in 2018, NASA had a budget of $20.7 billion. That's the budget they used to do everything, science, technology development, aeronautics development, human spaceflight, all told. 
Uh, this year, they're going to be working with $21.5 billion, or an increase of about $800 million. Uh, and most of that has gotten poured into the Science Mission Directorate, which is the part of NASA that funds like all the stuff we talk about here on the show, except for human spaceflight. Uh, that got bumped up from 6.2 billion all the way to 6.9 billion. <laughs> Another half and most million. Most of most of that went into NASA's planetary science budget, the budget that p pays for the robotic exploration of the solar system, which went from 2.2 all the way up to 2.8 billion. Uh, and I just have to sort of stop for a second here. And a few years ago, I was working uh, for the American Astronomical Society to uh, help communicate to Congress what our funding priorities were in planetary science. And at the time, like our dream goal, our hope was to get a planetary science budget of $1.5 billion. And, and this year, NASA will have $2.8 billion, uh, including all the money needed to continue the Europa Clipper mission, including the money necessary to develop a lander for Europa, including the money necessary for the next generation of discovery and new frontiers class missions. So, uh, and the good news just keeps going. Earth sciences uh, got their full budget back. Astronomy got their full budget back, including uh, full funding for the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, the W first. And W first, which I think we talked about a few months ago. Education got a 10% bump. Uh, SLS and Orion got fully funded. Basically, everything you could want uh, if that you're a fan of NASA got either the same amount of money uh, or a bunch more money to work with in fiscal year 2019. So, yeah. I mean, like, and you, you mentioned W first. So what are some, what are some like exciting specific projects that now we get to see moving forward? So there was funding put specifically to start developing a robotic mission to return the samples that Mars 2020 will cache on the Martian surface. Now it was a small amount of money, I think it was like $50 million uh, to sort of begin doing the pilot studies necessary to uh, pick up those samples that Mars 2020 will collect and return them to Earth for, for scientists to study. And if, if you want evidence that there's life on Mars, this is like the one and only thing you should want uh, because there's basically nothing that we're going to be able to do um, with a rover that will sort of definitively find evidence of past or present life on Mars. But if we can get those rocks back to Earth, we can use a hugely increased range of laboratory tests. And kind of think about this for, in comparison to what we do with Apollo. Like we spent a gajillion dollars to, to bring back moon rocks uh, from the moon. And we have spent the last 50 years using those same rocks. And in, and you know, before Apollo, we didn't know how old the moon was. We didn't know that the moon came from the Earth. We didn't know in any of these things. It's almost worth any amount of money to bring back actual rocks from the surface of Mars. And you know, I'm somebody who often poo-poo's the Mars uh, science uh, missions as sort of being overfunded. But if you're going to fund exploring Mars, and in my mind, this is like the one thing absolutely worth funding and um, this budget takes the first steps to actually making that happen so for me my the two things that i am most excited to see were the two things that got completely cut in the original proposed nasa budget and that is the nasa education division which had been zeroed out and is now fully funded and given more money nice. and a fresh makeover as uh what is it outreach and engagement uh, and so they have a lot of money that they're going to work with to increase NASA's public engagement and public outreach efforts, which have been phenomenal in the past. And I was devastated to see it gone. So that's back. Yeah, you and felt w a piece of it during felt... the shutdown, right? Like you yeah. you saw what it was like to not have that outreach happening during the government shutdown. It went for whatever it was, a month and a bit of like just nothing coming out of NASA. And we yeah. all just had to just like make up stuff. It was very sad. Yeah. I don't like that. Um, and the other part that I'm really excited to see back, I mentioned, is W first, uh, which I know when that got zeroed out in the proposed budget, so many astronomers were completely devastated that it was gone. Uh, they need, we need something to follow up after James Webb. Uh, and W first is going to do such different science than James Webb is doing. Every, like literally everything from exoplanets to 
the Big Bang is going to be covered by W first. And so the entire astronomy community was just in shock that there was no <laughs> money proposed for it. Yes. Like it was one of the big unifying things of like, everybody wants W first. Um, they got and... a free telescope. Yeah. They should use it. Free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let me inject a little bit of sort of reality check into this situation in two phases. Phase number one is what we say every year, which is, you know, this budget was supposed to come out in September. It is now February, which means even though they have uh, have all this extra money to spend for the first six months of the year, they've been spending as if they didn't have that money. Uh, and so the impact of it will not be as much as, as it could be. And the fact that there's so much uncertainty makes it very difficult to make any sort of plans to say, go back to Uranus or or Neptune. Uh, The other piece is that uh, this could be sort of the high watermark for NASA as in terms of its budget, as we see sort of in the years coming forward, Um, this sort of big proponent for NASA funding in the last decade has been a Republican Congressman, John Culberson. Uh, But back in November's elections, he was defeated Uh, by a a Democrat, and this budget sort of represents the last bit of his influence on on NASA, because they didn't really have time after November to sort of go back to basics and for the Democratic leadership to sort of establish their own priorities. And that's why we see things like the Europa lander still in this budget, because they basically just took his budget and, and ran with it. Uh, he's been a, a tremendously powerful force for directing funds towards NASA in the last five or six years. And it remains to be seen whether uh, the new Democratic leadership will support NASA at the same levels uh, that that Culberson has in, uh, in the last few years. It's not to say they won't, but there's an un- another layer of uncertainty now going forward about whether some of these priorities, like the Europa Lander that we've now spent hundreds of millions of dollars on, will actually be seen through to their completion, or if they'll get cut uh, in favor of funding of other priorities. And also, like the deficit and debt for the United States is at a all-time record high. I think it's like twenty-two trillion dollars. That's or something out of like scope that. for us yeah. here. Yeah, it's definitely out of scope. Um, but uh, you could imagine uh, future governments attempting to tackle the size of that debt, unless you don't have to pay it off ever, and then don't worry about it. But you know, assuming that someone may want to pay down that debt, you could imagine things like space exploration and science uh, taking a backseat to. Uh, Never mind. It's ridiculous. Just keep building debt. But letting us down. Yeah. <laughs> no. I. I. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm stoked. You get a lander. You get a lander. Everybody gets a lander. I mean, to 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 think that you were going to send a Venus. spacecraft. No. No. Not for Venus. To think that they were going to send a spacecraft to Europa and and they had a lander planned for it and then not have a lander is madness. Although those big gigantic Ike ice spikes that have now been theorized to exist on the surface of Europa. You're going to need, need to be careful, but still we really need we'll a, see what a comes. lander. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. Titan. What do we go? What do we say? Titan, Venus. That decision should be Uranus made in the next few. Uranus that decision should be made in the next few months. I think about whether the Titan helicopter or the, is it the asteroid mission. That's yeah. comet that. sample return mission. Season. That's right. Yes, that mm-hmm. decision I think is nearing its its final point, and we should be finding out pretty soon. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be Titan, Titan helicopter, Dragonfly. Yeah, yeah. We and, can only hope. Yeah, I, I feel bad because Steve Squires has just lost contact with the opportunity, and so now he's got time on his hands. And this and Caesar is his mission, but come on. But but you know what? This big budget, maybe both. Why not? Why choose? It's ridiculous to even have to choose. All right. Um, what do you got for us? We say that every time. We do, we do say that every time. All right. So Friday is going to be a really big day, and there's two things that I want to talk about. Normally we talk about things after they happen, and this may not happen, but I think it's important to talk about this. One is uh, the hardworking Hayabusa 2 mission, which, of course, has been out in space for four years. It has been orbiting asteroid Ryugu for about six months now, has already thrown all kinds of things down onto the surface of the asteroid to try and figure out how it works. Flip-flopping German, French, Japanese uh, rovers, all kinds of stuff. But on, on Friday, 
they're going to do the final uh, landing and sample return. And so um, they're going to be starting, uh, it's going to touch down on the 22nd at 8.15 Japan time, which is 6.15 Eastern Standard Time on Thursday. So, so around this time tomorrow, they will be descending with the spacecraft down to the surface of Ryugu. When they land, they're going to touch the surface very gently, and then they're going to shoot a bullet at the surface of the asteroid. That's going to kick up a little cloud of, of dust. They're going to capture that, and then they're going to back away from from the asteroid back away and, bring slowly. That back and bring that sample back to earth and one of the things that's really interesting was in the last couple of days they weren't sure because ryugu the the consistency of ryugu had been different than what they had been originally anticipating they did a bunch of tests just recently where they they mixed up a sample of material that is like the the sort of crumbled up rock that it looks like the surface of of ryugu is going to be and smashed that, and it did indeed kick up a little cloud of dust, meaning they're back in business, and it looks like they're going to be able to to do this. And if they are able to pull this off, they're going to be able to return back to Earth uh, and deliver a sample of an asteroid into the hands of of scientists ahead of. Or I'm actually not sure if they're going to be returning sooner than Osiris Rex. I shouldn't say that. Who comes so back Hayabusa's first? So Hayabusa is coming back late 2020. Yeah, oh, Rex Osiris is after that. Rex, Osiris Rex yeah. is after that. Rex yeah, is a ways 23? after that. Yeah, so so they'll have a sample. Um, so that's not the, just a surface sample, but a subsurface sample too. Because they're that's going later. to have smashed gonna, up. Yeah. the surface. So very exciting. Well, and yeah, and again, cool. like you can and you can watch it live stream. Well, so li right, the, you're going to be able to watch part of it landing. live stream. So yeah. you're going to be able to watch the first part of it live stream, and then as it gets closer to the surface, it's going to have to turn its antenna array, and so we're not going to be able to get that. But then it, I'm sure it will record the the information and then be able to to send it. The I I do love the fact that um, the Japanese space agency is being really cool and really timely about sending images back, sending um, the data, like pictures of the gravity measurements and the thermal measurements and videos from the service. They're being really good about like consistent, consistently updating us on like what's going on. We get fresh pictures every week. It's really cool um, that they're able to communicate all this. I think we talked uh, a couple weeks ago about how difficult it is to get images from the Chinese lander that's on the moon right now. And the Japanese efforts are like the complete opposite of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, their Twitter feed is, is awesome. Is awesome. Yeah. And that's generally like a lot of times you get news releases from NASA and whatever. But with Hayabusa, you pretty much have to follow their Twitter feed to get all of the updates. And then if something really important has happened, then they'll link that to some kind of press release. But great mission. And I just I just love I mean, I, I know I've gone on about this in the past, but I love like just the cleverness and sort of small budget willingness to try all these different ideas at the same time built together into a mission and then this transparency and getting this information out to us i think all the other space agencies could take a lot of lessons on the way the japanese have approached it and uh and it's and it doesn't have the same tension that the original Hayabusa mission had where it was like we weren't sure and they lost contact and they limped home and it delivered a m micrograms worth of samples <laughs> back to earth like this one's gone so well I mean now that you mention it like I don't like not just the stress level with this one compared to the first Hayabusa but the stress level of this mission compared to any NASA mission that's landed recently where you're like on the edge of your seat you're like oh, is it going to land? If it doesn't land, that's like billions of dollars down the drain. We have no backup. This is the only thing that's ever going to do this ever. And if it fails, like we're done. Yeah. Like that's how a NASA, land, a NASA landing feels. It's like James Webb, the launch of James Webb. I, can't... I mean, even with Insight, like we were, you know, so nervous, even though it was a landing method that we've yeah. done many times before. Uh, and we were getting information from the CubeSats. Um, I mean, with Hayabusa, like, we're just, everything is happy. We're like, everything is going great. If it doesn't work, 
That's okay. You got another rover you could try. <laughs> <Just> throw this <laughs> one at the, ro the rock. On board. Yeah. Just go with the next one. Uh, and uh, Kimberly, you're on my screen right now. Uh, people can search for cold worlds from their couches. That's right. If you're bored, go online and search for uh, planets at the edge of the solar system or search for brown dwarfs that are just hiding in the void between us and Alpha Centauri because there's a really cool new updated citizen science project through the Zooniverse. It's called Backyard Worlds. And what it does is it lets you, it, it provides for you uh, a bunch of data from the WISE mission, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, which is an all sky infrared survey. Uh, and it has series of these images over, uh, I think more than a decade. And it creates these little animated flip books of sort of like a time lapse of that part of the sky. And what you do is you look for tiny little pinpricks of infrared light that are traveling across the sky uh, that could be, you know, a tiny little brown dwarf, or it could be an M dwarf, or it could be a planet or a tiny Kuiper belt object at the edge of the solar system. So it works very similarly to, you know, uh, any other citizen science uh, large data mining project uh, like Galaxy Zoo or like um, Planet Hunters and that it collects all the, the citizen science data and then filters it for quality. But this is a cool thing that you can do from your home to help search for Planet Nine if you want. Uh, Eric one asked on YouTube, what is the transmission time to get to Hayabusa? It's 19 minutes is the amount of time it takes for data to get to and from uh, Hayabusa 2. I thought you were going to ask what the transmission time from Planet Nine was, and no, I have no answer. No, for you. I don't think we know the answer to that until we find it. Um, the the one discovery that they made and they announced this sort of as part of this mission was this really cool the the oldest coldest white dwarf that's ever been yeah. discovered, and they so, found this circumstellar disk around it. Yeah, so uh, I should say that the Backyard World is a re it, they just relaunched. Uh, they've been going for about two years with uh, an older set of data from WISE. And uh, coinciding with this relaunch, they published a paper that came from this, uh, that was discovered from this portal, which is, like you said, it's the oldest, coldest circumstellar disk around a white dwarf that's ever been seen. It's like 10 times older than any other white dwarf circumstellar disk that we've discovered before. That's the kind of stuff that is just like hiding in this massive infrared data set that there's just not enough human eye power yeah. to you I know, think WISE sector. is a good candidate for the astronomy thing that is like most admired and appreciated by astronomers and least known <laughs> by the public like WISE has just turned up this ridiculous range of uh, results covering basically any field that you could imagine and you you never believe that one mission could have done so many things but it's just every time you turn around it's just like here's 5,000 new things from wise and yeah. yet you never end up hearing about any of them and, 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 uh, sort and, of breaking through and then yeah, it I mean, turned into an asteroid that, hunter right yeah. well I mean some of the things that wise has founded uh, like it has defined new types of stars like there are uh, below M dwarfs below some of the, uh, even the, the hotter brown dwarfs that had been discovered before, there's like three other classes of brown dwarfs that we've only discovered because of WISE. And they fill in that gap between brown dwarfs and planets, which is something that we're like, why is there a gap there? There really isn't, we just needed WISE to tell us that. <laughs> Um, all right, so before we wrap things up, I just want to let you know the other interesting thing that's going to be happening on Friday is friend of the show, Space IL, is going to be launching their lander atop a Falcon 9 rocket, and it's going to go to the moon. Yay. Yay. So Yoav, Landsman, and the rest of the Space IL crew, we wish you uh, good luck. But it doesn't land for a long time, No, right? it's going to take 40 days to actually get to the, to the moon and, and begin its landing. So I'm sure next week we will be glad to talk about their successful launch and, and their upcoming flight. And then about 42 days from now... We will actually talk about their Someone landing. remind us to talk about it 42 days from now. I'm sure it'll come up in the news, and I'm sure we'll be ready to talk about it. But just at this point, I just wanted to, you know, we've, 
I know that Yoav is often in the comments. He watches the show, has been a guest on the show. We've hung out in person. Uh, this, I, they've just got to be so excited about this mission, and I can't wait to see it launch and and have them be on their way to the moon. So, so good luck, guys. Everybody involved in the mission. I can't wait to see how this works out. All right, Kimberly, again, you're on my screen. Uh, tell us something interesting that you're working on. Oh, so I've had a super busy week covering all of the exciting space news, a lot of which we talked about tonight with Neptune uh, and the Hayabusa uh, touchdown that's happening uh, and a really exciting astronomy outreach program that was developed in California that's bringing the vibrations of the universe to deaf students. Um, so that's what I've been working on. You can read all about it on eos.org or on my Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier. Morgan. I want to plug the story we didn't talk about, which is that the InSight mission is now bringing us live weather from Mars. If you want to know what the, light, the temperature is on Mars this hour of like two days ago, you can find out what that is. And it's crazy. Sometimes you wake up and it, it's warmer on Mars than it is where you happen to be. And sometimes it's 100 degrees colder. It's really cool. Uh, let me just uh, and, see right now. I'm going to put this up on the screen. See, so people... see what it is right, yeah, right now so... for us. And it lagged by a couple of days because of the downlink time. They only downlink data every couple of days. Uh, but you can see if you scroll down, um, there's a graph. If you keep scrolling down, you can see a temperature graph over the course of the last few days. And you can see sort of find your time and exactly know what the temperature is on Mars. And it's just so cool. And the wind like speed and the air pressure now and the pressure. With the weather report from Mars. <laughs> oh. Like, Hi, oh. it's weekly space hangout time. It's this temperature at Alicia. Other than that, if you want more of, of this excitedness, I will be on Fraser's show on Monday, uh, which is good because I will not be on the weekly space hangout next week. So Monday, a time, a place, we will be there. It will be at least 50% as good as Kimberly's. Yeah, yeah, and if you missed it, Kimberly was was the guest uh, earlier on this week on my show, and she did great. It was a fantastic conversation. Finally, got a chance to find out more about her history, her work in shifting from science to journalism, and then we got a chance to answer everybody's questions. So I thought, and we made a bet. We which... did make a bet that I, I'm slightly more confident that I'm going to win in 10 years time now that all this planetary science has been funded now that i have morgan agreeing with me oh really like, all right. he's on my side mm, okay that's just how it's gonna work okay all right all right all right well so uh of course i just a couple of hours ago released a new episode on the guide to space all about saying goodbye to mars opportunities so he i can't say that you won't cry a little it's pretty sad so but it was great and uh, it was wonderful to, you know, my career as a science journalist has, again, sort of enclosed all of the Spirit and Opportunity missions. I started this work in 1999. I was reporting on their construction and launch into 2003, 2004, and then they arrived on Mars and reported on their entire both Spirit and Opportunities missions and was able to report on the end of Opportunity. So it was great to see, sort of, to be able to... I did the same thing with, with Cassini as well, although Cassini was in, in construction a lot before I had even started my work. So it's kind of weird. feels old. Age, death comes for us all, I think is the point that I'm getting at. I felt at. the same way with Kepler. Yeah, Kepler, Kepler was like, your Kepler was your walking side by side yeah. with a mission. Yeah. Morgan, what's yours? Oh, I don't know. Obviously, I sort of hitched my wagon to Cassini for a long time, um, but I don't know what the first mission that like I watched sort of grow up from from nothing and and become something and then go away. Yeah. Insight. Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> New Horizons. <laughs> New Horizons. No. Yeah, but I don't remember like was... when New Horizons launched. You know, I certainly you know I was in high school. I would have known about it. Nineteen ninety. No, sorry. I don't... Two... 2007? 2006? 2006. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember it as and it's like not an done event yet. In, in my life. Yeah. Anyway, maybe next week you'll, you'll have thought of one by then. Yeah. We'll think. Have until Monday. <laughs> all right. I'm going to put all of us on the screen. Um, so 
As always, a big thank you to my co-host, a big thank you to our special guest, Emily Holt. Uh, definitely go and check out more of her work. That was a lot of fun to talk to a, an archaeologist. Like I said, me and Morgan, our dream jobs. Um, and uh, a big thanks to everyone in the chat, to the moderators who are moderating that chat, everyone for the Weekly Space Hangout crew, uh, and Paul doing whatever he's doing. Uh, we'll see Goodbye, Paul. all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. And then I always, people always say that I shut it down too quickly. I don't know what the delay is. I'm just going to press stop now. <laughs>